ESS has made lots of headlines. A uh, number of years before, it's actually supposed to serve new, uh, researchers with the first neutrons. For example, as you mentioned last week, about 600 scientists gathered in Lund for the, uh, for the Foundation Stone ceremony. And of course, as a nanoscientist and technologist, you might think, well, what is in there for nanoscience and nanotechnology? What can we do with it once it's here? Well, before showing you, I would, however, like to uh, give you a little introduction into soft nanomaterials, because that, I think, is the area where we will certainly profit enormously from ESS. When we talk about soft uh, matter, we talk about materials made up of basically three primary building blocks, colloids or nanoparticles, um, polymers and surfactants. And of course, there are many um, also natural biological variants of them um, with somewhat intermediate properties. What can we do with soft uh, matter when it comes to nanotechnology and nanoscience? Well, we can, for example, try to copy nature, how it has made uh, beautiful photonic structures like uh, uh, opal as, an as, a, as a natural uh, gemstone or the uh, beautiful uh, wings um, from butterflies. By assembling nanoparticles and colloids with the right sizes so, such that they form colloid crystalline structures, where then visible light is diffracted and you, you create these beautiful colors. Or we can try to learn from nature and, and then assemble nanoparticles into uh, artificial structures that will mimic, for example, viruses, virus shells, uh, microtubules, and so forth. Another area is intelligent and responsive carriers or catalytic systems, where again we can profit from the fact that we can self-assemble soft materials, soft matter, into, into intelligent and, and responsive uh, systems. Of course, at the fountain, at the basis of nanoscience and nanotechnology is a successful characterization. And we have all learned that we can uh, look at nanostructures, for example, by extending um, the resolution of an optical microscope by going to a, an electron microscope or doing uh, raster techniques like atomic force microscopy or scanning tunneling microscopy. But when we talk about soft matter, as the name says, these are very, very fragile systems. They are held together by very weak bonds, um, which makes them soft. But that also means that very often we actually need an in situ characterization, because when we bring them to the electron microscope, we have to work in vacuum, and that's usually the end of the structures we want to look at. Moreover, if you're interested also in technological applications, many of the systems are non-equilibrium, so we have to look at processing conditions, and that requires not only in situ, but also real-time characterization. And this is really where the scattering techniques come in. And so we can actually use X-ray and neutron scattering to characterize these systems in a um, basically non-invasive, real-time, and in-situ manner. Why? What is scattering? Well, some of you might not be experts in scattering, and this is why I thought I could give you a little introduction to scattering by actually doing a daily life analogy. We have to design the experiment. In this case, it's marching Roman soldiers entering into the sample, which here would be a forest. They will be scattered. So we look then at the distribution of scattered Roman soldiers in reciprocal space, if you want. And from this distribution of our scattered probe particles, we can then deduce the structure, shape, composition of the nanostructure that scatters our probe. In this case, of course, it's easy. We all know how it looks like. In case of nanomaterials, it might be different. So what is the scientific version of the scattering experiment? Well, we'll use probably a gigantic source like ESS with a powerful linear accelerator that um, accelerates protons. They, they, they basically chip off neutrons. And we can then use the neutrons in instruments like the two shown here that are already currently operating at other neutron sources, like the, the neutron source in Switzerland at PSI or the Institut Laue Langevin in Grenoble. The result in reciprocal space will also look differently. It will be a distribution 
of either photons or neutrons on a two-dimensional detector, or in case we are interested in the dynamic properties of these systems, it might actually be uh, the decay with time of something like an intermediate scattering function that tells us all about the local and not so local dynamics, how our particles diffuse and so forth. And then, of course, the structure that result in these um, scattered um, probe particles on our 2D detector will look like those, like, for example, an assembly of anisotropic ellipsoidal magnetic particles that we can align with an mag external magnetic field and will then give ri uh, rise to an anisotropic scattering pattern, as you see in the first row of the results here, or it can be highly ordered colloidal particles forming up a, a photonic crystal, for example, or it could be the local diffusion of a protein in a very crowded environment, as you find it, for example, in the interior of a cell, all becoming visible because we can use neutrons and X-rays in doing these scattering experiments. Now, why should we use neutrons? We already have synchrotrons, one being built currently and almost ready. Well, neutrons are indeed special. They have particular properties that make them very interesting in particular to studies of matter. They are charge neutral. They are scattered by the nucleus of the atoms. And that means they are deeply penetrating and so we can use them, for example, to do uh, imaging of very large pieces of materials, of engines and so forth. They also carry a spin, which makes them ideal to study magnetic structures. And, and for me, that's for a soft matter uh, nanotechnologist and scientist, the most essential part. They're actually sensitive not only to atoms, but also to their isotopes because of the scattering process of the neutrons with the nucleus. And this is the part I would like to focus because we have to think what is the probability of a neutron being scattered by some nucleus, or if you want, some atom that makes up then the final nanostructure. Well, in billiard scattering, it's easy. It's the size of the spheres that make up your game, and there is not much to be changed, because at the end, the game will say you always have to use the same sphere size. For neutrons, it's very different. This is a comparison of, if you want, the scattering length or probability of X-rays and neutrons being scattered. On the left side you see it for x-rays, on the right side you see it for neutrons. For x-rays it's sort of boring. The larger, the heavier the atom is, the larger the probability, the larger the scattering cross-section. For neutrons it's very different. It almost looks stochastic. And what you really see, and that I think is the power of neutron scattering, that it not only depends on the atom you're looking at, but it also depends on the isotope. If you, for example, take hydrogen, Hydrogen is a very, very light atom that in X-rays is basically invisible. For neutrons, it has a reasonable cross-section, but if you then add a neutron to the proton and make heavy hydrogen, deuterium, you actually dramatically change the scattering cross-section or scattering probability and becomes almost comparable to something like uranium. And so we can really play with that. We can actually change isotopes without changing the properties of the material in terms of its chemical and optical and so forth properties and work on this by doing what is called neutron contrast variation. Again, I have thought about a uh, everyday life explanation of that. What is a contrast variation? Well, let's take the story of Harold and Lola. Lola is the conformist. She likes everything the same. She has a cloth that is actually with the same ornament than the, than the background of the apartment and the chairs and so forth. Harold is the individualist. He doesn't like this. He is separate. He's different. One day the monster comes. Of course the monster detects Harold immediately because he has a very different scattering cross-section or visibility or contrast compared to the background. Whereas Lola is still unnoticed by the monster, and so the, the herald is eaten, but Lola continues to live happily, more or less. How can we use this in nanoscience? Well, if you think, for example, of particles making up photonic crystals, they are at ultra-dense states often. We can make them responsive, they will interpenetrate, but how do they really look? There's basically a dense system that has basically particles only. 
there is very little contrast left. If we were to do, say, a confocal microscopy experiment, for example, we wouldn't see anything, or not much. But now we can take some of these particles, and we exchange the hydrogen with the deuterium. Same chemistry, basically, same properties, but now they become visible. They become painted, and so the neutrons see them, and so we can look at their structures. Of course, we can do a bit more interesting experiments. Um, one, for example, an area that I think is vital in nanoscience and technology is how nanoparticles interact, for example, with proteins in the serum or uh, uh, somewhere else, because depending upon their interaction with proteins in the serum, they might become covered, and then they, uh, they will actually interact with cell membranes uh, or other particles very differently. They might lose their stability, they might aggregate, depending upon uh, their coverage. Of course, there is an incentive then, for example, to create stealth particles where we make them inert uh, with respect to the proteins. One way of doing this is by adding a polymer layer onto the surface. However, how do we make this surface layer visible? How do we also monitor how the particles interact with that? If we do X-rays or electron microscopy, we only see the gold core of these gold particles. But we can use neutrons. Depending upon the solvent, everything is seen, or we might change uh, the, the, high, uh, the, the water content with deut uh, deuterium oxide, heavy water, and then we only see the shell. Or we change it such that we only see the core. And so this gives us high-resolution information on not only the particle, but also on the functionalized surface layer, and then when proteins are added, uh, we can make them visible. And we can do what is called contrast variation by taking solvents with very different ratios of, um, of water and heavy water, and then specifically highlight parts of the structure. So if I can conclude, I hope that first of all, I have been able to convince you that soft nanomaterials are really intriguing, but they often require in situ and time-resolved studies. Here, it's where the neutrons come into the, uh, into the game, because combined with contrast variation, they give us high-order information, very complex structures. ESS, of course, will be unique. It will have an unprecedented neutron flux and will be a world-leading infrastructure, but we'll have to use it. I hope we'll all use it and spend happy times at ESS uh, progressing with nanoscience and nanotechnology. So as you increase the neutron flux, your damage is going to be potentially significant. No, that's the other uh, advantage. Because of the very different interaction uh, of neutrons uh, with matter, there is basically no radiation damage. Uh, in particular, when you work with, with uh, uh, living systems, uh, if you work in life sciences, proteins and so forth, quite in contrast to X-rays, where indeed, once we go to the modern synchrotrons, uh, we always have to worry about radi radiation damage, and that's not the case with the neutrons.